How shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Jesus prayed to the Father, Sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. The flower fades and the grass withers, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Before we begin our study this evening, we need to make sure that we're in fellowship. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come together this evening, the freedom we have in this country that has been preserved and paid for by the lives of so many over the last 200 plus years who have been willing to make the ultimate sacrifice in order to secure our freedoms. Father, now as we study, we pray that you would illuminate our thinking by your word that as we grapple with these important issues related to creation and origins, that you would give us clarity of insight in what your word actually teaches. We pray these things now in Christ's name. Amen. As we continue our study in Genesis chapter 1, last time I introduced four questions that we must address as we begin to move beyond the first verse into the remainder of the chapter. These questions are important because there has been a tremendous amount of pressure for the last 200 years on Christians to somehow assimilate what is found in science with what the Bible says, that somehow to put the two together to make them harmonize. And there are a number of assumptions that are associated with that uh, attempt that I think are or at least need to be pointed out, and many of them are somewhat dangerous. The primary pressure has come from the idea that science has somehow discovered truth, capital T, absolute truth about origins, and so we try to make the Bible fit what uh, the uh, uh, apparent conclusions from science are. So we have to look, first of all, to understand precisely what the Bible does teach. Now, this is, this is an important issue because there have been a number of things that have occurred over the centuries where people have not been clear on what the Bible teaches. They've come to a false conclusion of what the Bible teaches, and then that's juxtaposed uh, with science. What happens, I mean, the classic, the classic case is the case of Galileo being tried by uh, church courts because he wanted to shift from a, a geocentric solar system, an earth-centered solar system, to a heliocentric or sun-centered view of the solar system, which we know is correct. And just about any time you bring this subject up when you're talking with a, a proponent of, of evolution or science, will say, well, see, this is a case of science versus the Bible. This is a case of science versus religion. And that is a completely false construct, and it betrays the ignorance of the evolutionist as to what was going on or the fact that he's just unwilling to face the historical realities of what took place during the Middle Ages. And it is also the fact that Christians cower when they hear that shows that, that for the most case, they're pretty ignorant of the situation too. What had happened in the Middle Ages, starting much earlier, go back to about the 11th or 12th century, especially as the Muslim hordes were putting pressure on the on uh, on the Byzantine Empire and were coming up, swooping in from the from across Turkey, capturing uh, Constantinople, and I think it was in the 15th century. As that pressure developed, people were fleeing from the Eastern Orthodox Church and from Greece, and they're fleeing up into Europe, and they're bringing their libraries with them. And during that period of time, starting really much earlier, like around the 11th century or 10th, 12th century, they're bringing with them the ancient Greek manuscripts of Plato and specifically Aristotle. And Aristotle made a tremendous impact on an Aristotelian view of science, and the universe made a tremendous impact on the Western Church. And what happened is that the Western Church began to assimilate their view of Scripture and to begin to interpret their Scripture within an Aristotelian framework. So what we actually have taking place in the Middle Ages is not a view of science and a view of the solar system and the universe as being something that was uh, purely biblical, but it is the it is the Bible being in, reinterpreted within this Aristotelian 
framework so that you end up with a with a geocentric view of the solar system. Now, this is because you're taking the Bible plus Aristotle. So it's not a purely biblical interpretation. Furthermore, there were problems with things in, in language. Another example would be that Job talks about the four corners of the earth, and the Hebrew there for corners is one of many words that's used. Actually, it means the, 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 the four directions on the earth, the, 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 four, uh, uh, the, the four directions or the four um, uh, dimensions of the earth. It's not necessarily the technical word for corners. That is a right angle. And so because it's a mistranslation and misunderstanding of the meaning of the Hebrew word, it led some people to think that the Bible taken literally holds to a flat earth theory. They talked other passages that talked about the pillars of the earth. There was a misunderstanding on how to interpret the figurative language and, and uh, poetry. For, then again, you have another example of right in our chapter that we'll get to next time when God separates the... Um, uh, waters above from the waters below by a firmament. That's the traditional word that's been used in the King James Version and New King James Version. And firmament has the idea of something that is solid. But the Hebrew word rakia does not mean something solid. In fact, there are passages in Isaiah and in the Psalms that talk about the, the heavens being stretched out by God. And that, the, in fact, there are passages in Job which talk about the earth being suspended on nothing. It just hangs in the air. So the Bible does not have this view of either a flat earth or that the heavens are some sort of solid mass. Neither does the Bible teach a earth-centered solar system. But when you have a lack of correct understanding of the original languages and when you have taken a, when you're trying to take a biblical view and interpret it within a human viewpoint philosophical framework, you're always going to come up with erroneous conclusions. And what happened with the trial of Galileo was that the Bible, uh, an Aristotelian interpretation of, of science that, that dominated biblical studies, was really on trial. It was, it was not science versus the Bible. It was modern science versus ancient science. It was modern science versus ancient science. They were they, and modern science was coming along and using uh, principles based on empiricism, whereas er, the er, Aristotelian and the ancient views of the universe were based on more of a rationalistic deduction. They didn't have the instruments necessary to observe. They didn't have a telescope like Galileo had. They had, they were working on a purely mathematical model or purely logical model, and they were coming up with the wrong conclusions. So the trial of Galileo wasn't a challenge to biblical truth. It was a challenge to Aristotelian view of the universe as opposed to a biblical view of the universe. So don't get caught in that particular trap. But that all points out the fact that it is important for us to make sure we are accurately understanding just exactly what the Bible says and what it doesn't say. And then once we formulate an understanding of creation based on what the Scriptures say, then we can go out and on that model we can have a framework for correctly interpreting the empirical data that science develops. Of course, modern man wants to do it the other way around. We want to conclude that, that science and empiricism correctly uh, discerns the way things actually are, and then we want to bring that in to, to govern the interpretation of Scripture. And as long as we believe in the sufficiency of Scripture and the inerrancy of Scripture, we will always start with Scripture, and no matter how real or how clear something may appear according to science today, we know that we walk by faith and not by sight. Now, walking by faith doesn't mean that we're going to believe it despite the evidence. But it does mean that the evidence can clearly be falsely interpreted by modern science. And so the Word of God, which is clear, is going to be more real for us and more real to us than what uh, our experience may bring to bear. So we have to go through and ask a number of questions or answer a number of questions.
that are usually raised, and as I pointed out last time, I've, I've been studying this whole subject since I was about 14 years old, and I've spent literally thousands of hours, and I've read most of the major books that have been written from a creationist viewpoint and a number of evolutionary texts over the years. So I am not, uh, and I've gi given tremendous amount of thought to every one of these questions. In fact, one of the reasons that I majored in Hebrew when I went to Dallas Seminary was to try to gain all of the skill I could to resolve the problems related to simply the exegesis of Genesis 1-1 and 1-2. So having said that, I doubt that there are too many people around who have given that much attention to it. I've spent a tremendous amount of time uh, also in private discussion, as I was a couple of weeks ago at the pastor's conference out in uh, California. We spent a lot of time one night at dinner uh, discussing just this very issue and in some cases arguing about different different points. And it's not always as clear as one would like it to be. Now the questions I raised last time that we need to answer, are, first of all, the question, isn't Genesis 1 myth comparable to other ancient legends and mythologies? Isn't Genesis 1 a myth? There are many people who think that this is just myth or legends of the Jews, and it isn't to be that you'll hear often hear people say, well, the Bible isn't a book about science. It's not a science textbook. That's correct. That, but if the Bible is the inerrant and infallible Word of God, then that means whenever the Bible addresses empirical observations, it will be in, inerrant and infallible. Whenever the Bible makes a statement about history, even though it is not a history textbook, whenever it makes a statement about history that something took place in history, then it will be it will be accurate. So we reject the idea that it is myth, but we have to show the evidence for that, which I began to do the last time and we began we were running out of time, I was rushing, so I want to hit that again. Second question. Could there be millions of years between Genesis one one and one two, and could this not be the time frame for historical geology, the dinosaurs and cavemen? We'll, we'll probably get that answered tonight. Third, how long are the days in Genesis 1? Are they 24-hour days or just lengthy periods of time or ages? Could they possibly be the, the ages comparable to the geologic ages? Fourth, could God have used evolution as a mechanism for creation? And this question addresses the solution of theistic evolution, theistic evolution. The third question addresses the question of what has come to be called progressive, uh, evolu or progressive creationism. Okay, the first question. Isn't Genesis 1 myth comparable to other ancient legends and mythologies? And the root assumption to this question is an evolutionary assumption. Well, you're taught in the uh, in, in, uh, comparative religion courses and universities and what... Uh, what underlies much of religious liberalism and neo-orthodoxy is just the, this idea that religion developed over over time. It went just as as biology went from simple to complex, so you had uh, religions go from simple to complex, and and how they th why they think that that animism, spiritism, and polytheism are simple compared to monotheism, where there's only one God. Why that is a move from simple to complex uh, befuddles me because if you read any of these systems that have a hundred different gods, how that can be simple and one god complex is beyond me. But their assumption is that, that monotheism is a very sophisticated development in the history of human thought and comes on the scene very late. But see, this just bellies the fact that, that I've been, I argue in this whole debate is that evolution at its core is an assault on Christianity, is an assault on the cross of Christ. And any compromise with evolution at any level is a compromise of the gospel. Now, you may not understand the strength of that argument and all the dimensions of that just yet, and that may be one of those things that you hear somebody say, and hear me say now, and may take you years before you fully appreciate the impact of it, but that's exactly what's going on. So we took the time last time to just evaluate this by making a comparison between Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. 
and 1-2, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved or was hovering or fluttering over the face of the waters. A very simple, straightforward account of creation. Compare that to the Babylonian myth known as Enuma Elish or Enuma Elish, taken from the first two words of the story, which would translate would be when above. That's the title for uh, many most ancient uh, Eastern Near Eastern texts. Is there the title is just the first two words in the text. This piece of uh, mythology was discovered in between 1848 and 1876 as archaeologists unearthed. King Ashurbanipal's uh, library at Nineveh. He lived from 668 B.C. to 630 B.C. And this is the creation myth of the Babylonians, how the earth was created and came into existence. It was primarily written not simply to explain their origins, but to explain the supremacy of their god Marduk, who was the God specific to Babylon and as sort of a defense of Babylonian political supremacy over the ancient Near East. Now, as we look at this, I want you to to, um, think about two questions. I want you to think about what you observe by comparing the pagan text with Scripture. And I want you to think about the fact that, that what the differences are and what the similarities are. Okay, the differences and the similarities. Let's just read through the first first section. When above, the heaven had not yet been named, and below the earth had not yet been called by name. That basically means they hadn't been created yet. Below, uh, and when Apsu primeval, their begetter, Mumu and Tiamat, she who gave birth to them all, still mingled their waters together, and no pasture land had been formed, and not even a reed marsh was to be seen, when none of the other gods had been brought into being, when they had not yet been called by their names, that is, the other gods, and their destinies had not yet been fixed, at that time were the gods created uh, within them. Now, when we look at that, a couple of things that we see of similarity. Notice the heaven hasn't been created yet, and the earth hasn't been created yet. You have the presence of water just like you do in Genesis 1-2, that the earth is without form and void, and there's darkness on the face of the deep. So there's this this watery mass and chaos. Um, then there's a, a formlessness, chaos. The Hebrew word that we'll study later on is that the earth is without form and void. And so what we have here is this chaos, chaos or unformed water, watery mass at the very beginning. Now, that's pretty much where the similarities end. What we have is a a distinct difference, and that is you have three personages present. You have these three gods, uh, Apsu, Mumu, and Tiamat. And uh, notice they are physical. This is a a physical representation or personification of, of these are nature gods. They mingled their waters together. If you're an artist, what is this going to look like? You have this intermingling of three things, Apsu, Mumu, and Tiamat. And at this, nothing else has happened yet. So there's this formlessness and chaos, but you have this eternality of some sort of substance. See, the Bible, this is where you see a distinction in the Scriptures. We have in the beginning God creates the heavens and the earth. There is nothing before that point. But when uh, Apsu, Mumu, and Tiamat begin, you know, when this happens, there's already something existing. There is matter existing, so you have an eternal matter that, that exists. They lived many days, reading on, they lived many days, adding years to days. Now we get into the creation more specifically. The divine brothers gathered together. They disturbed Tiamat and assaulted their keeper. Yea, they disturbed the inner parts uh, of Tiamat, moving and running about in the divine abode. Skipping down, Marduk took from king of the tablet of destinies. Now that indicates a sort of fatalism, like the fates in Greek mythology. 
And Marduk took from Kingu the tablet of destinies, which was not his rightful possession, after he'd vanquished and subdued his enemies, strengthened his hold upon the captive gods, and then he returned to Tiamat, whom he had subdued, the lord, that is Marduk, trod upon the hinder part of Tiamat, and with his unsparing club he split her skull, notice the violence, and cut the arteries of her blood, and caused the north wind to carry it out of the way places. Marduk split Tiamat open like a muscle into two parts. Half of her he set in place and formed the sky as a roof, and he so he takes her skull, splits it open, put part of it from part of it he creates the heavens, and the other part he creates the earth. It says he fixed the crossbar, posted guards, and commanded them not to let her waters escape. So there's a boundary set on the waters. And a great structure, its counterpart he established, namely Ashara Earth. He created stations for the great gods, their, the stars, their likenesses, the signs of the zodiac he set up, and he determined the year, defined the divisions. Stars aren't set. Uh, Notice that stars aren't set up until about, in Genesis, till halfway through, and it also has functions for uh, signs and for, for, uh, for a calendar. If you look at that, you see that there are various, uh, various similarities in the order of events. There's the watery chaos, then there is the creation of, um, uh, for, uh, then, then there's the, um, uh, separating the waters and the control of the waters and the division of different categories and then the establishment of the stars. So it's a, it's a similar order of events. Now, in the Enuma Elish, there are three gods mentioned, Apsu, Mumu, and Tiamat. Now, these are material gods. They're not immaterial. Their waters uh, mingle together, and it is from their material substance that, that the heavens and the earth are, are created. So there is no creator-creature distinction. Everything is inside the box. Now, this is important to, an important image to uh, understand, and that is that you have creation, matter, and energy all inside this box. And in this box, you have the three gods, and it is from them that everything is created. But there is some sort of eternality of matter. Everything is still being explained by man within a box that describes all of human experience. I want to come back to that analogy a little later on as we go through our study this evening. Now, the other thing that you see missing is the sovereignty of God. There is no God who controls everything you have many different gods, and there's a battle among the gods, and that's somewhat reminiscent of the angelic conflict and the angelic rebellion. So the, the, what I would say is that you have a, 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 a memory, a residual memory of certain creative events that influence this legend, but because of human depravity, because of Romans 1, 18 and following, man is suppressing the truth and unrighteousness, What's happening is over time they are doing away with a personal creator God. And the reason is if there is a personal creator God who establishes righteousness, then man is answerable and accountable to him. And if the human heart, the human mind is totally depraved, as Scripture teaches, then it is a state of rebellion and it wants to suppress that truth and unrighteousness. So it begins, as Romans 1 says, to worship the creature rather than the creator. And the, creator, the idea of the creator-creature distinction begins to be blurred, and you do away with the cre creator, and you're just left with the creation itself. And so you begin to worship the, cre the creation. And whatever you have at the beginning, which is three nature gods, whatever you have at the beginning, that's always what you end up worshiping. If there's nothing at the beginning more than matter, then you're going to end up worshiping material things, and you're going to produce a materialistic culture. And this is what we see in our modern times, is that we've got a materialistic culture where there is no, no such thing as God or spirit or anything like that, and so we end up worshiping, worshiping matter. But the thing I want you to, main thing I want, you, want to show you from that is that there's a radical difference between the mythology of the ancient world and what you have from the Bible. 
There, it, it, it's, it's completely and totally different. It is categorically different. You cannot come along and say that the Genesis 1 is influenced by the, by the cosmogonies of the ancient world. If anything, you, you, you're driven to say that the way it's stated in Scripture is specifically to refute the cosmogonies of the ancient world, that it is God who creates everything. It is not that matter, some sort of preexistent matter, uh, generates itself or is generated by some sort of gods. But in effect, it's self-generation because you have the existence of these material nature gods, and out of them in some sort of way, uh, the earth generates itself. That's, that's a more mythical, legendary explanation than what you get in modern Darwinism, but it's still the same thing. You have the eterna- eternality of matter, and, and, and there's originally chaos, and from chaos, given enough time plus chance, you get uh, order derived from that. So the answer to the first question is no, it's completely impossible for the Bible to have been influenced by uh, mytholo- the, the myths and the legends of the ancient world, and what the Bible says is completely Different. It is not legend or myth. Now, the next question that we have to answer is the question: Isn't Genesis one, uh, or isn't? Uh, excuse me. The second question is: Could there be millions of years between Genesis one one and one two? And could this not be the time frame for historical geology, the dinosaurs, and cavemen? Now, this is a, an important question. There's really two questions here. One is, is there a gap between Genesis 1, 1, and 1, 2, and how long is it? Is there a gap between Genesis 1, 1, and 1, 2, a time gap, and how long is it? Could there be millions of years between Genesis 1, 1, and 1, 2? And the second question is, can we cram historical geology, the dinosaurs, the fossils, everything that doesn't seem to fit the Bible, can we cram that into the gap between Genesis 1, 1, and one two. So the first part of this question is, is there a gap between Genesis one one and one two? And yes, I believe there is a time gap between Genesis one one and one two. First of all, we know that God is perfect, and His work is perfect. We know this from several scriptures. Um, Let's look, first of all, before we get into that, let's look at the breakdown. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. This is a complete sentence syntactically in the Greek. Then Genesis 1.2, the earth was without form and void. Literally, it's empty, and it it is deserted, distorted, and empty. Darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Now, the way that's punctuated is wrong. These are three circumstantial clauses. The main verb doesn't actually come until verse 3. So you have three circumstantial clauses that describe the main verb in verse 3. But the point that we're making is how does the earth become without form and void? Where does the darkness come from? And why is it necessary for the Spirit of God to generate or flutter over the face of the deep. So to answer that, we have to go back and compare this with other scripture. First of all, God, at first point, God is perfect. His work is perfect. The rock, his work is perfect. For all his ways are just. A God of faithfulness and without injustice. Righteousness and upright is he. Matthew 5.48 states as well, Therefore you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Because God is perfect, His work is perfect. God does not create something less than perfection. Now, in Genesis 1-2, we're told three things about the the condition of the earth. First of all, it is formless and void, or it uh, it has no form, and it's uh, chaotic. Uh, There are many different uh, translations of the Hebrew phrase there, tohu vabohu, but it indicates that something disastrous has happened, something Every, in, in other places, as we'll see, it indicates judgment. In other places, it just indicates chaos. But this is not, not uh, a chaos that is God just simply creating the random parts of the universe. And that's one view is that Genesis 1-1, God just sort of creates the, the formless building blocks uh, 
of the universe, and then in Genesis 1-2, he starts to uh, give form and function to those building blocks. Elsewhere in Scripture, the terms, this is the second point, heavens and earth are used elsewhere in Scripture of a completed working universe. Now, the retort to this is that, well, Genesis 1 is distinct, so we're going to have to treat all of these terms as if they're different from the way they're used in the rest of Scripture. Now, the problem with that is that that would be fine if this were actually recording revelation that was given at the beginning of creation. But remember, this is Moses writing down the Scripture that is in 1446 B.C., So the Jews on the plains of Moab already have a history of biblical or revelatory terminology, and they're going to interpret words on the basis of that. Everywhere else in Scripture, words like light and darkness imply light is good, darkness is evil, Uh, the deep has an evil connotation, tohu vabohu has a connotation of judgment. So if the very first or second verse in Genesis has these three phrases, and you're revealing though that's being revealed or written for people living in 1440 B.C. who already have an oral tradition that has given certain baggage to those words, then when they hear those words at the beginning, then it's going to have that, that, um, that connotation for them. Same thing with heavens and the earth. Everywhere else in Scripture, this has a certain connotation. You can't come along and say, well, let's just make it unique because this is the beginning, of, this is the, the starting point of creation. I understand why they make that argument, but when you're writing to people for whom this terminology already has a meaning, then that doesn't work. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. So what we have here is a specific Hebrew syntax or grammar that indicates a change. Normally in Hebrew, what you have in narrative is it looks something like this. Here's a, this is called a vav. Now the reason you call it, I pronounce the W's like a V, is because of so much Germanic scholarship, and that's the system of pronunciation I was taught. This is simply the English and. And then it would be attached like Vaomer. Uh, here you have the, the Hebrew verb for to say and to speak. For example, you have, and God said, and God said, and God said. So you have a conjunction and then a verb and then your noun. Remember, Hebrew reads from right to left. And then you would have your noun like uh, Elohim. Now, whenever you want to say make a disjunction, I mean, in most narrative it goes, that's why Hebrew reads kind of boring sometimes for some people, and it shouldn't be translated that way into English, but in, in Hebrew it has that sense of movement, and this happened, and then this happened, and then that happened, and this happened, and every sentence begins with, and then this, and then that, and then this, and this is called a vav consecutive, which indicates that the action just goes on consecutively. But when you want to break the action, then what you use is a noun. You take the the letter Vav and you attach it to a noun such as Aretz, which is the noun for the earth, and Ha is the definite article. So you have the the verse began Vaha Aretz. Now that indicates a break in the action because it's not the, it's not the pattern of conjunction verb, it's conjunction noun. And that indicates a break, and this is called a disjunctive vav. And so when you have a disjunctive vav, it is not action that is consecutive to the preceding action. It doesn't read, in the beginning God created the earth, and the earth was without form and void. That would be consecutive. That's how some people want to read it. What you read is a break. It should be translated, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and now are more strongly, but the earth was without form or void. Then we come to our main verb, which is the perfect of the Hebrew verb, hayah, and this normally means was and indicates a 
state indicates a state or condition and since it's not the original state or condition of 1 1 we could translate it became and the earth became formless and void and darkness was on the face of the earth now since these are consecutive clauses our excuse me circumstantial clauses that relate to the main verb of said in verse 3, which is the main verb, we, can tr- we should translate them, now the earth became, or the earth had become formless and void, or simply the earth was without form and void, because it's stating the condition that the earth was in when God spoke in verse 3. It is not the same condition of verse 1. The Vav consecutive breaks that, breaks the action. So it's clear from the grammar that you have an original creation in verse 1, and then there is this break where there is some sort of introduction of chaos between verse 1 and verse 2, and then verse 2 takes up what's happening in terms of six days of more accurately stated restoration. Six days of restoration. So according to the syntax, you have a disjunctive valve which breaks the action from verse 1, and the three circumstantial clauses that describe the action, uh, or describe the situation on the earth when God speaks in verse 3. Now that's the grammar. So you've got a grammatical argument here, and then you come along and you have a lexical argument from word meaning. And this lexical argument is based on three terms that are used here. Uh, This is, um, in case you get lost in the notes, point number one was God is perfect, his work is perfect, Deuteronomy 32.4, Matthew 5.48. Second point, the heavens and the earth is a term that is elsewhere used of a completed working universe. Third, to get a non-gap creation here, you have to propose a unique meaning for every term used in 1, 1, and 1, 2 that is uh, not substantiated elsewhere in Scripture. You have to say, well, this is just this is different because it's the first time. Uh, fourth, you have a syntax problem, the disjunctive vav and the three circumstantial clauses. And then point number five, you have the meaning of these terms. Point number five, we're going to deal with the meaning of tohu, tohu vabohu. Tohu v'bohu in the in the Hebrew. This basically means formless or shapeless or something that is completely out of its original design. And and bohu means empty. These words are used together. Tohu is used a few times by itself, but bohu is never used apart from apart from tohu. If you look at a couple of passages that are related to this, you see that there is a sense of judgment that is in, that is in the context of these passages. Jeremiah 4:23 to 26 is a passage where Jeremiah is warning the Jews in the southern kingdom of the coming judgment of Babylon on Judah that they would be destroyed. And in order to portray the destructiveness of this this uh, judgment, he borrows imagery from creation. He says, I, I looked on the earth, and behold, it was formless and void, tohu v'bohu. And this is, of course, a prediction of the judgment coming on Israel. And to the heavens, and they had no light. Well, what's the situation at the beginning of Genesis 1? There's no light. That indicates, once again, a situation of judgment. I looked on the mountains, and behold, they were quaking. Well, what's happening in Genesis 1-2? The Holy Spirit, literally, Raham, he's fluttering. He's, he's vibrating the creation. I looked on the mountains, behold, they're quaking, and all the hills moved to and fro. Verse 25, I looked, and behold, there was no man, and all the birds of the heaven had fled. Just like in the original creation, there's no life. There's just emptiness because of, of divine judgment. In Jeremiah 4.26, I looked, and behold, the fruitful land was a wilderness, and all its cities were pulled down before the Lord, before his fierce anger. So there's this context of judgment. Tohu v'bohu is not just a bland term indicating some sort of shapeless, formless, empty circumstance at the beginning stage of creation, but everywhere else in Scripture this terminology is used, 
it uses or it is in a context where there's divine judgment. Another passage is in Isaiah 34, 11. Isaiah 34, 11, and, but pelican and hedgehog shall possess it, and owl and raven shall dwell in it, and he shall stretch over it the line of desolation and the plumb line of, of emptiness. That's in Isaiah chapter 34, verse 11. I'm, going to turn, I'm turning there right now. We're going to take a look at the context. Isaiah 34, verse 11. This is the judgment on the nations during the time of the day of the Lord's vengeance, which again is prophecy at the end of the, of the tribulation. And it is specifically related to what happens in uh in Judah, and, and to the nations after Armageddon, that uh, this refers probably to Babylon. So there shall be no, no life there. The, he shall stretch over the line of desolu- desolation, that's Tohu, and the plumb line of emptiness, that's Bohu. So Tohu of Bohu indicates a judgment. Now, where did that judgment come from? Well, from this we have to make a theological deduction, and one that, is, that I think is important. Last time I emphasized Job 38, 4 through 7, that when God laid the foundation of the earth, that the, the angels, the sons of God, shouted for joy. They were all united. So the angels are present. Well, it seems to me that you have to have a time period for the fall of Satan, which is described in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. So when did Satan and the angels fall? They, there are only two options. He, Satan and the angels either fall between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2, or they fall after the creation week. Now, I don't think that that fits the scenario at all for them to be created on the third day and then fall right after the creation week. It seems to me there has to be some time. The judgment terminology in verse 2 suggests that what we're talking about here is the aftermath of the fall of the angels. Now, Moses didn't go into that because that's beyond his purposes at this particular time. But what causes the the formless, the emptiness, the tohu vabohu of verse 2, the darkness and the concept of the deep, the chaotic, watery deep is... Uh, the judgment on the angels. So what we have here is a creation. There's a chaos, which is the result of Lucifer's fall and the angelic rebellion. And as a result of that, there is a judgment on the angels, and their abode apparently prior to their fall was on the planet. Now, I'm going to suggest that what happens as, as we look at terminology where God stretches out the expanse of the heavens is we have this expansion terminology. And, and if, if, and I'm going to make that a big if, but if modern science is correct in the observation, I think it is because of what we see in terms of the Doppler effect or the red shift that takes place when you're looking at the stars through a telescope and they're measuring them, this red shift factor indicates that they're moving away from the Earth. So that suggests that the, that the universe is expanding rather than contracting. Now, what I would suggest is that at the very beginning, God doesn't have a very big universe. Remember, it's a box. It is not infinite, as modern science wants to suggest. It's not not without boundaries. It has boundaries. And when it's originally created, there's no stars there. It's just a space-time box. And in this space-time box, there is a planet that is the center of God's attention, and that is the abode of the angels. And that was where Satan dwelt, and our Lucifer dwelt. But it became the scene of his judgment and rebellion against God. And so God basically turned the lights out in the universe. See, God exists in unapproachable light. And when you come to Revelation at the end of the Bible, there is no darkness. God is light. So where does the darkness come from? The darkness is something that is added. It doesn't just, just, it's not just there. Darkness throughout Scripture is a sign of some sort of evil, some sort of judgment, as we'll see in a minute. So God turns the lights out. Now, in a completely dark universe, what's the temperature? 
There's no source of heat. There's no source of friction. In a completely dark universe, the temperatures are probably going to approach absolute zero. It's going to be frozen, and anything frozen like that is, is again, going to shrink. So there's this shrinkage that takes place. In other words, what I'm trying to say is, According to, if physics operated anything like they do today, and the law of physics were probably completely different at that time, then you have a, a mass that is, that is being, that is shrinking due to the extreme cold of the situation. And it's during this time that God judges the angels, and it is this time that, that Satan raises a challenge to God's ability to rule his creation, and that God has not given him a creature the opportunity to prove what he can do. So it's at this point, then, that God is going to restore the earth and is going to set up this, this new universe in which God is going to set forth a test case on planet earth to give Satan the oper- opportunity to demonstrate what he can do and for God to demonstrate that no creature can live or operate independent from the Creator. So this is the scenario. The earth is without form and it is, and dark and void. Then we read that uh, darkness, vahoshek, darkness is on the face of the deep. And the concept of darkness throughout Scripture always has a negative connotation. For example, just a couple of verses, Exodus 10:21. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward the sky, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even a darkness which may be felt, a thick darkness. It's negative. It's associated with judgment on Egypt. Verse 22, So Moses stretched out his hand toward the sky, and there was thick darkness in all the land of Egypt for three days. They did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days, but all the sons of Israel had light in their dwellings. Notice the contrast between light and darkness. Psalm 35, 6, Let their way be dark and slippery with the angel of the Lord uh, pursuing them. Uh, Joel 2, 2 mentions a day of darkness and gloom a day of clouds and thick darkness as the dawn is spread over the mountains. This is associated with the judgment at Armageddon. Matthew 4.16, the people who were sitting in darkness, that is spiritual darkness, not knowing the truth, saw a great light. And those who were sitting in the land and shadow of death upon them a light dawned. John 3.19, this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. So throughout the scripture, darkness has a very negative connotation, connotation of judgment, sin, and evil. So what you have here is not only the use of tohu vabohu, but you also have the mention of darkness. And then the third word that is used is the word tehom, which means deep. The deep, the tehom, is often symbolic of chaos and death. For example, in Exodus 15, 5 and 8, related to the Red Sea, the deeps cover them. They went down into the depths like a stone. Verse 8, And at the blast of thy nostrils the waters were piled up. The flowing waters stood up like a heap. The deeps were congealed in the heart of the sea. This is from the song of, of Miriam praising God for the deliverance at the Red Sea. Then Ezekiel 26:19. For thus says the Lord God, when I shall make you a desolate city like the cities which are not inhabited, when I shall bring up the deep over you, and the great waters will cover you. Again, this terminology is used associated with judgment and associated with something negative and something evil. So we not, you know, if there were just one mention of one of these terms, then we might be able to say, well, this is an unusual use. But three, there's a threefold use of terminology in verse 2 that is associated with judgment, sin, and evil everywhere else in Scripture. So when we look at verse 2, we should infer that there is something radically different that has taken place here as a result of some action that's not mentioned in verse 1 that describes the circumstance on the earth when God spoke in verse 3. The, the earth is without form and void. The darkness is on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God begins to vibrate or hover over the face of the waters. Now, this indicates that there is some sort of time gap. It's based on grammar. It's based on vocabulary. And it's based on theology. Now, the second part of that question I asked is, can we put into this time gap between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2, or can we place into that uh, 
the uh, geologic ages? Can we place the fossils? And can we place uh, can we place some sort of uh, pre-Adamic race? Now that idea was set forth in the 19th century. Let me give you a little history of this interpretation. I have been able to trace this interpretation back to at least the 8th or 9th century A.D. When I was out in California, I was talking with Todd Kennedy, who pastor of Spokane Bible Church in Washington State, and his sons at Biola, and, and I'm waiting for the paper. But Todd told me that, that his son did a paper on this at Biola, and he's traced it back to the to the early church, probably the 3rd or 4th century at least. So the idea that grammatically there's a time gap between 1-1 one, one and 1-2 one, didn't originate in the 19th century. The fact that there's a gap between those two verses goes back to the early church. Second, it was not there in order to ram, cram, and jam uh, historical ages in there. It was understood to be the time frame when Satan fell. That was the was the predominant and only well was the only use of that view up until the 19th century. This was the same view that Milton held. Now Milton wasn't John Milton who wrote Paradise Lost and Paradise Regained was a Puritan theologian. He wasn't solid on everything that he held, but this was his view that's expressed in Paradise Lost and Paradise Regained that this is a time within which the angels were created and Satan fell. Now, at the end of the 1700s, at the end of the 18th century, you have have the rise of historical geology. Now, let's put that in its historical context. This is in the Enlightenment. And in the Enlightenment, man's reason reigns supreme, and there is a definite anti-biblical slant to man's thinking. There is a rejection of God's Word, and so... Up to that point, up to the mid-1700s, scientists, almost without exception, held to the fact literal that there was a literal Noahic flood that lasted a year and that all of the fossils were formed in the flood. There was a clear belief in flood geology. But starting in the late uh, 18th century, there was a rejection of the Bible. There was a rejection of Noah's flood as a reality, that if anything, it was just a local flood and that fossils were formed uh, gradually over a long period of time. You have the development of Lyell's uniformitarian theory of geology, which incidentally now is falling out of vogue with uh, modern geologists. But that was the predominant theory. And as a result of that, as a result of that, they, historical geology at the end of the 1700s and early 1800s was postulating a date of the earth of 45,000 years, that the earth was only 45,000 years old. Well, at that time, you've already had the the influence of of, of science science and enlightenment thinking on the church for about 150 years, that somehow you can come up with truth, capital T, apart from Scripture. And so science is developing its reputation that this is, this is true. They know what they're talking about, and they have accurately interpreted the data, and you've got 45, a 45,000-year-old earth. So a man by the name of Thomas Chalmers, who was a Presbyterian uh, pastor in Scotland, in fact, he was one of the foremost Scottish Presbyterian theologians of that time, and he was probably comparable to a Lewis Berry Chafer or a John Walver to his generation, and he set forth a theory that, well, all we really need to come up with is 45,000 years, so we're going to put that and the fossils into this gap between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2. Notice, the pressure is coming from a secular interpretation of geology that the earth is only 45,000 years old, and so he's trying to come up with only 45,000 years. By the end of the 19th century, you're talking something close to a billion years, and by now it's about, or, or, or I think for, for the earth you're talking about, um, let's say several, you're talking about at least a million years or several million years by the end of the 19th century. Now it's up to about 300 million years. It keeps getting larger. It's one thing to try to come up with 45,000 years. It's another thing to try to come up with 300 million years. Now, what what he did, his view was very popular, and by the end of the 19th century, you get a guy by the name of Pember, um, 
uh, G.H. Pember, who wrote a book called World in Chaos, and he holds the same view, and he tries to put the geologic ages and everything in between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2. And this became known as the gap theory. What they really did was they hijacked a view that had been around since the early church in order to try to uh, assimilate and compromise with the findings of science, thinking that the findings of science were accurate. Remember, we've already studied the fact that dating systems may be extremely flawed, but they're assuming that the dating systems were accurate. And so they began to shift their interpretation of Scripture in order to fit the conclusions of science. But there are some basic and fundamental problems with that view. First of all, if you have a life form, pre-Adamic life, some sort of pre-Adamic race, and all of the all of animal life prior to Genesis 1-2. Let's put it up here like this. You have this Genesis 1-2, 1-2 judgment. And then prior to that, you have some kind of life. Then there is this, this judgment, and what happens to all this life? It's dead. It's packed in ice, and it becomes the source for fossils. At least that's the explanation. Well, this runs across. This pre presents some serious problems to theology. First of all, Romans 5:12. Let's go there first. Romans 5:12. Romans 5:12 states, "Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and death." and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. Now, in that passage, death has the definite article. This would be the monadic use of the definite article, emphasizing a unique death. But it seems that Romans 5.12, you can place an argument from context that this is spiritual death. And remember, as I have been teaching again and again and again, spiritual death is the penalty for sin, and physical death is the consequence for sin. So even though a lot of people want to use Romans 5.12 as an argument here, I don't think that works because Romans 5.12 is a passage that deals with spiritual death primarily. But you still have the passage in 1 Corinthians 15.21 and 22 to deal with. And in order to do that, you have to pay attention to the context of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And the context is physical resurrection. For example, in verse 20, But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. What kind of death is in view in verse 20? It is physical death, not spiritual death. And then Paul states a principle in verse 21. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. So obviously that's talking about physical death and physical resurrection. So it is clear that, that the death here is not spiritual death. Furthermore, death here does not have the article in the Greek, which indicates it is the, it is, it is the quali our quant qualitative idea of death. Death in principle came through man. For by a man came death in principle, and by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. So we're talking about the principle of death. It cannot, according to this verse, precede Adam. If you have anything die physically before Adam, then Christ does not need to go to the cross. Let me say that again. It's an obvious thing. If anything dies before Adam, if there was any pre-Adamic Life And remember, there's a difference between plant life and animal life in Scripture. If one animal dies before Adam sins, then death enters into the world. And if death enters into the world before Adam sins, then death, even in the animal kingdom, is not the result of Adam's sin. And therefore, uh, it, is an, it would mean the cross was not necessary. So if one thing dies, if there's one thing fossilized prior to Adam's sin, then the cross isn't necessary. That is why evolution is a subtle attack on the necessity of the cross. If you believe in evolution of any kind, if one thing dies, you have one thing die before Genesis 3, then you don't need the cross. And that is heresy. Heresy. 
1 Corinthians 15:22 for as in Adam all die so also in Christ all shall be made alive. So furthermore if there was if there was death if there was physical death before Genesis 1:2 and the fossils were there then the contention is that Adam is put in perfect environment but a perfect environment that's a graveyard See, if Genesis 1-2 is a judgment on all that life that existed prior to Genesis 1-2 and it's all fossilized, then what you have is the whole earth has become a graveyard. That's what all the fossils are. And that is not perfect environment. Death would be screaming at Adam everywhere. There would be fossils everywhere on the earth. And he would be looking around going, what do you mean if, if I eat the fruit I'm going to die? Look at all this death around me. It just would not make sense. Furthermore, the contention is that you could have two catastrophes, one before Genesis 1-2 to form fossils and another at, at, at the flood. This is impossible. Fossils don't always flow in the same pattern. They're all mixed up. Anywhere you go, some places they're in one order, some place else they're in another order. You may be in Australia and it follows one pattern, and you go up to Montana and it's in another pattern. And so... All the fossils had to be formed by the same catastrophic event. It's either the catastrophic event of a judgment in Genesis 1-2, or it's a catastrophic event at Noah's flood. If it's a catastrophic event at 1-2, then you have a worldwide flood where the waters swirl around the earth with incredible power for an entire year in Genesis chapter 6, and there's no, there's no trace left of it in the geologic record. That's absurd. See, all the fossils are in what's called sedimentary rock. What lays down sedimentary rock? It's water. So if all of those fossils were laid down in Genesis 1-2, they would have been, all that evidence would have been destroyed by the flood in Genesis chapter 6. So you're only left with one option, and that is that all the fossils had to have been formed by the Genesis 6 flood. Furthermore, you have examples of tree trunks in multi-strata deposits. That means you've got one tree trunk that goes through, and you've got multi-strata of going up there indicates that it was all laid down at one time. Now, the usual argument, this is a fourth point, the usual argument I hear has to do with dinosaurs. You always get somebody who operates on some presupposed principles that dinosaurs couldn't live at the same time of man. How could that be? Well, first of all, you're assuming that they lived on the same piece of real estate. Lions and tigers do not coexist compatibly with human beings, but we don't occupy the same piece of real estate. There are many animals alive today and many that have uh, become extinct since the flood that do not live compatibly in the same environment with man. And, and yet... Uh, what, what we have is the existence of these creatures, but they didn't exist in the same area as man. Second, you have uh, evidence, fossilized evidence, very possibly, at a place called uh, Glen Rose, Texas, down the Paluxy River, where there are dinosaur put, footprints fossilized in the same strata as human footprints. Now, I know what I've seen because when I was in high school, I worked on a dig there one summer, and what we would do is we would sandbag the river, pump it all out, and we would trace these trails of footprints, and you would have human footprints. It looked like somebody running through mud. Sometimes you had more defined footprints. Sometimes you had less defined footprints. But you can pretty much tell that something has a foot. You could sometimes see a big toe uh, digging into the mud, and you could follow a track, a left-right, left-right pattern down through the mud. And then also crossing it at an angle, you would see a dinosaur, big, big three-toed, uh, footprints going at another a angle. And then we would dig out the side bank of the river, and you could trace it, and you could measure the stride of both the man and the three-toed creature. And this is just outside the park down there at Dinosaur State Park. And they, they made a movie of it, and there's been a lot of debate over it. So we also need to realize that originally dinosaurs were created as grass eaters, as er herbivores, as were all uh, prehistoric uh, excuse me, all creatures at that time. So there wasn't a conflict until after the flood. Now, what happened to the dinosaurs? Well, they died out after the flood. Note that the current suggestion in, in science is that there was an asteroid or some other catastrophe that changed the environment on the Earth so that they could no longer survive. 
Well, gee, that's what the Bible says, is there was a worldwide catastrophe known as a worldwide flood, and the post-flood environment was completely different from the pre-flood environment, and so the dinosaurs could not exist. But there are, there's also many different so-called extinct dinosaurs that have been discovered existing in recent years. There was one type that was uh, brought up in a fishing net, net by the Japanese back in the 70s. There was another one back in the early 20s. And there's also a continuing and ongoing legend, and this is only one of them. This is one from related in Africa, but I've heard of similar legends in the rainforest of, uh, of uh, South America as well. This is a story of Macaulay Mbembe. This is a creature that scientists believe is uh, could be a surviving sauropod dinosaur uh, located in equatorial Africa. Uh, the early accounts related to this creature uh, go back to 1776 when one explorer wrote in the history of Loango, Kakanga, and other kingdoms in Africa about a group of French missionaries who had found the tracks of an enormous unknown animal in, in the jungle. It, in that account, he writes, it must be monstrous. The prints of its claws are seen upon the earth and form an impression on it of about three feet in circumference. That's the footprint, three feet in circumference. In observing the posture and disposition of the footprints, they concluded that it did not run this part of the way and, and that it carried its claws at a distance of seven or eight feet from the other. So, Elephants don't have claws, folks. They have toenails. So this is a very interesting description. What kind of monster was it? Well, they don't know. In 1913, the German government sent a survey team in there, and uh, Captain Freiherr von Stein, Zulausnitz, was the leader of the expedition, and he included a report that there was a creature very much feared by the Negroes of certain parts of the territory of the Congo, the Lower Ubangi the Sangha, and the Ekalemba rivers, and they called the animal Mokeli Mbembe. This animal is said to be of brownish-gray color, its size approximating that of an elephant. It is said to have a long and very flexible neck. Some spoke of a long muscular tail like that of an alligator. Canoes coming near it are said to be doomed. The animals are said to attack the vessels at once and to kill the crews, but without eating the bodies. The creature is said to live in the caves that have been washed out by the river in the clay of its shores at sharp bends. It is said to climb the shore even in daytime in search of its food. Its diet is said to be entirely vegetable. So in 1976, a herpetologist named James Powell from Texas went to Gabon to study rainforest crocodiles, and he learned the stories from the Fang people in that area, and he also wrote an account related to that. At this stage, no one has seen the Macaulay Mbembe, but there are more and more stories related to this. So there you have an example possible example of this kind of prehistoric monster that is so-called by uh, modern science, but you have dinosaurs living in different, different environments. So there are too many assumptions that underlie the idea that dinosaurs and men can't exist together. Where do you get that in assumption? Modern science says that. But that's, that does not have to fit with the scripture. In fact, in Job, you have a description of Leviathan and Behemoth, both of which could easily fit descriptions of certain kinds of dinosaurs. So we come, it's amazing how our mindset is shaped by the culture around us that certain things just can't be. Dinosaurs and men can't live together? Well, why not? I mean, who's to say that? And other kinds of assumptions that come along. When you look at the scriptures and just take the scriptures on their own, the creation going back to the six-day restoration would normally be about five or 6,000 B.C. and no more. The only reason anybody comes along and says there's more is because modern science, on the basis of dubious dating techniques that are loaded with presuppositions that predetermine their conclusion, say that. And the agenda of modern science is simply that God does not exist and we don't need God and everything came from its own natural uh, origin self in a self-generating universe.
Well, we'll come back next time and we'll dig into things a little further and start getting into the first days of restoration starting in Genesis 1-3 with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word. We thank you for the truth that is there and that we can accurately study this to give us a framework for understanding creation and understanding that you are our creator and that all things have come from you. Father, we pray that you'd help us to understand these things. In Christ's name, amen.